Hello, welcome. We're on part three of systems of equations and what we're focusing on are systems with three variables, but much of what we do applies beyond three variables. So just imagine for a moment, and we'll look at a picture of this in, in a little bit. Imagine you have a system with an X and a Y and a Z. Okay, and you're trying to find when these things, these equations, in this case they will be planes, uh, not just a line, but an actual plane on a three-dimensional region, and we'll look at that you're trying to find when they meet. You're trying to find the value of x, y, and z. You're trying to find that point. Well, that's not so easy to do when it's written like this. So in, like in all systems, you want to find a way to simplify it. It's hard to read. So we have a process called Gaussian elimination. Gaussian. Gauss figured out a whole bunch of stuff about systems of equations, and uh, he's done so much work in mathematics that we name many things after him. And Gaussian elimination allows us to manipulate our system so that it's easier to figure out the values of x, y, and z. Now I'm going to leave a bunch of space here. We'll fill the gaps in. But eventually what we're going to do is we're going to get to a, a, this situation down here after we do some elimination. Our first equation remains unchanged. But our second equation will end up being y plus 2z equals 5. And our third equation will be that z equals 3. And when we get to this step, it's much easier to see the value of x, y, and z. And that's because we have the value of z written here. z is 3. So then we can back substitute so that y plus 2 times z, 2 times 3 is 6, y plus 6 is 5, so y is negative 1. And then we could take those values, negative 1 and 3, and solve for x. x plus 2 minus 3 is x minus 1, and x is 2. And we can find our solution, which we'll get to, where it's a point where z is 3, y is negative 1, and x is 2. But the question is, how do we get to this? How do we get to this step? And that's what Gaussian elimination is all about. We also refer to this as triangular form because it kind of looks like a little triangle here, row by row. Each row is decreasing by one more term. So that, that shape might help us because essentially to get to this form right here, in these spots we need to get our zeros. We're zeroing out those terms. And the order we're going to do this, and it gets more sophisticated with lots of problems, but we'll start in this spot. We'll make sure we have a 1 there, and then we'll use that to zero these two spots out. Then we'll go up here, and if that's a 1, it is in this case. If it's not, I'll teach you how to manipulate it. But then you can use this value here, once it's 1, to get a 0 in this spot, and then you're done. So we start here, make sure there's a 1. Use el it's Using elimination, you'll see how it works to get zeros here and here. And then we go up to this spot and repeat to get a 0 down there. So. The, the, the guiding principle of Gauss, Gaussian elimination, he realized three things. You can move equations around without changing the answer in the system. You could multiply any of the equations by a value that's not zero without changing the answer to the system. And you can combine equations together and replace equations without altering the solution to the system. And you can look in the textbook, there's a, a much more detailed explanation of what I'm saying here. But the basic idea, and this goes back to even simple elimination, if you had two equations, let's say x plus y is 10, x minus y is 6, if you use elimination to solve these, think about what you're doing. You're combining the equations, you get 2x equals the y's cancel out 16, you're getting a new equation that is a part of this system that you can use to say x is 8, and then you can use it to solve for the value of y. But that's because you're able to create new equations by combining the other ones, and what you get is another equation that's a part of your system. That can be applied here as well. So we want to keep track of our steps here. And I already have a 1 in this spot. If I didn't, I can multiply the equation uh, by any non-zero value. So if I, had a t if I had a 2, I would just multiply the first row by 1 half, and that would give me a, a coefficient of 1 in this spot. All right, this is my first row, second row, third row. But to get a zero here and here, I'm going to write this notation down. I take the first row and I add it to the second. And then I take that result and I put it in second row because x plus negative x is going to give me that zero. And I'm going to take all the terms from the first row, add it to all the terms in the second, and then replace that second equation with the result. That's what this is saying. First row plus second row, replace it into the second row. 
in the fourth row over here, I need to first, I'm going to multiply the first row by 4, add it to the third row, no, subtract the third row from it, excuse me, First 4 times the first row, minus the third row, and then take it in that result and put it into the third row. Because 4 times x is 4x, I'm just focusing on these front terms, minus 4x down here will give me a 0. And now I write this notation down so I can keep track of my work. And in the next step, I, have, I haven't really touched the first equation. I'm not changing that row. But in the second row, I get a 0. And then negative 2y plus 3y is plus y. And then negative z plus 3z is 2z. And then 1 plus 4 is 5. I got that new equation. And then I'm going to have a 0 down here because it's 4x minus 4x is 0. 4 times every term in here, right? It's 4 times the first row minus the third row. 4 times 2y is 8y, so it's negative 8y, minus negative 6y is negative 8y plus 6y, which is negative 2y. Right? And then we have negative z times 4 is negative 4z, minus 2z is negative 6z, and then finally 4 minus 20 is negative 16. So I'm already starting to get closer. I've got these two zeros here. I just need to get one more. And I already have a 1 here. If I didn't, I can multiply that equation by whatever I need to to get that coefficient to be 0. Uh, oh, be 1. But right now, all I have to do is get a 0 in this spot. The way I'm going to do it, there are different ways. I'm not going to use my first row. I'm going to use my second row. Using the first row can cause issues and get this term to be non-zero again. Right? It's possible. So I'm going to use my second row, though twice my second row, and add it to the third row. And then whatever that equals, I'm going to take it, that whole thing, and put it into the third row. So the first row is unchanged. Second row is 0 unchanged plus y plus 2z equals 5. The third row, though, 2 times the second row, it's 2 times everything here, added to these terms. We're going to get 0 in the front still, plus 0. And then again, you know, we use the second row because we already have a 0 here. So there's no chance that we'll introduce a non-zero value into this spot. 2z times 2 is 4z, plus negative 6z is negative 2z. And then 2 times 5 plus negative 16 is negative 6. Finally, in the last row, you could just solve for z and see it that way. But I like to use the exact same notation. I want to get that coefficient to be 1. It's negative 2, and so the reciprocal is negative 1 half times everything in row 3. And whatever that result is, I want to put it into the row 3. And that actually gets me, I didn't actually need as much room as I took here. Let me scroll down. That gets me to this. Let me bring this back up. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, let's drag this up. Boom. So that actually gets me to this spot right here, where z is 3, and then I can back substitute. So to recap, we started up here. We recognized how we would get these two terms to be 0. We kept track of that. We added the first two rows, multiplied the first row by 4, and added to the third. And then we took our results and rewrote them in the second and third row. Then we wanted to eliminate this term by adding twice the second row to the third row and replacing the third row with it. And then we multiply our third row by a non-zero coefficient to simplify it. And that actually leads us to our answer right here. OK, so here's the 3D interpretation of this problem. And I just want you to understand that what we're dealing with in these problems, these blue planes are the equations. And the point where they meet, this point A, is the point we just found. right? So I shouldn't have messed with that. But it's very, very hard to see on a graph what these points where these points are, especially in three dimensions. And the algebra becomes super useful, but they do meet at one particular spot where all three planes meet each other. And I've got to rotate for some reason. Uh, but that's the point where they meet, and that's what we just found. And what else could happen with these planes? Right? Let's try to draw this without uh, making you confused. Um, there are three things that could happen. If there's one solution, like in our case right here, imagine there's one plane going like this, okay, and another plane 
could be at any angle. I'll try to make it as neat as possible, like this. So th this, these two, they actually cross right now. I'll have all the intersections be at a, a blacked out line, at a whole line. They have an infinite set of solutions, but there could be a third plane in there. Maybe it's going like this. Okay. And there is an intersection there between the green plane, the blue plane, and also at this one particular spot, the red plane. That's the solution. That's the situation we have three planes and one solution. That could happen. And then there could be infinite solutions. Imagine you have a plane like this. Imagine you have another plane like this. So far they're crossing on this line right here. So there's an infinite set of solutions. But I could throw in another one, another plane. And as long as it's also crossing at that line, we have a situation where there are an infinite set of solutions. So maybe it's like that. It's hard to picture in 2D right here, but they're crossing at that line. You could have lots of situations where there are no solutions. So maybe there's one plane going like this. Okay, and then there's another plane going, I don't know, like this. Try to imagine it going that way. It is crossing this. There is an intersection here. Those, so those two planes have infinite solutions, but for a whole system, we might have a third plane, maybe going like, not like that, it's too hard to read. Maybe like this. And it could even, you know, it could cross both planes actually, but at different spots. So maybe over here, the red and green are intersecting, but over here, the red and blue are intersecting. In other words, there's intersections between the blue and the green over here, between the red and the green over here, and the red and the blue over here, but there's no common intersection. There are no solutions. So there are no solutions infinite solutions and one solution. So the, the linear properties that apply to a two-dimensional plane also apply to a three-dimensional plane. And algebraically, we can look at these things together. And then we're done. So what does a no solution system look like? Well, imagine you were trying to solve a system. Okay, x plus 2y minus 2z equals 1. And then maybe our second equation is negative 4y plus 6z equals 8, and then finally negative 2y plus 3z equals 2. Now you don't know yet if there's a, a solution or not. You just know you're trying to get your zeros, and you've got your zeros here already. You need this to be a 1 and then get a 0 there. So what, what are we going to do? We're going to multiply the second row by uh, negative 1 fourth. By the second row, whatever we get, we'll put into the second row. And what's that going to get? Well, if we look at that, it's going to get x plus 2y minus 2z equals 1. In the second row, we get 0 plus 1y. And then we're multiplying by negative 1 fourth. So it gets us, um, what did I do there? Equals 8. You know what? Actually, let's multiply by a half. I apologize. Watch what happens. Make our lives a lot easier. If we multiply this by uh, negative 1 half, excuse me. And do that in blue. My instinct was to get a one in this spot, but I'm just going to show you with a shortcut. If I multiply by negative one half, that'll get you a two, right, in this spot right here. And then six times negative one half is minus three. So that's minus three z. And then eight times negative one half is negative four. So you don't need to get a one in this spot. It sometimes makes it easier to solve it. But in this case right here, look at this. Um, if, if we now try to get to zero this spot out, this location, we would add row two to row three. Take the result and put it in row three. But if we try to do that, our first equation remains intact. Nothing's being changed there. Second equation is still where we just left it. So 0 plus 2y minus 3z equals negative 4. But in the third row, we get 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals negative 4 plus 2 equals negative 2. And when you have a situation like this, you're saying that 0 equals negative 2. That's an impossible situation. 
So we assume that they do meet, and what we ended up with is something that cannot be true, so there's no solution. So we can see that algebraically. And then finally, we look at one last case. What about infinite solutions? With infinite solutions, it's actually very similar to what we might expect to see in linear equations. So here we have 2x plus y plus 4z equals 2. And then finally, 4x plus, hang in there, 8y minus 4z equals 16. So here, let's say you're trying to solve this, and you're trying to zero out these two spots, here and here you would multiply the first row by negative 2 and then add it to the second row and put the result in the second row and to get a 0 here you multiply the first row by negative 4 add it to the third row and put the result in the third row now when you do that the first equation is unchanged x minus y plus 5z equals negative 2 but in the second row you have 0 plus 3y minus 6z, right? I just doubled everything in the second row times negative 2 and then added to the second. And then I equal 6. And then when I add, multiply the first row by negative 4 and add to the third, I get 0. And then negative 4 times negative 1 is po it's positive 4 plus 8y is 12y minus 24z equals 24. And at this point, right, what do we do? Well, we could just multiply the second row by a third and put the result into the second row. And we can multiply this, let's get a, a one here as well just to see what's going on, one twelfth by the third row and put the result in the third row. You don't have to do it in that exact order, but when we do that, what we see, first equation, second equation is y minus 2z equals negative 2, and the third equation ends up being y minus 2z equals um, equals 2. Sorry, this is positive 2 up here. So we have two equations here that are the same. That's interesting, and that's indicative that there are an infinite number of solutions. But we can really finish this problem if we say, well, what if we did row 2 minus row 3 and put the result in row 3? In other words, we want to try to get a zero down here. Well, when we do that, the first equation is the same. Second equation is the same. But the third equation will be zero plus zero equals zero. And that tells you something. It tells you that z could be any number. And if z is t, we can now backwards substitute to solve for y. y minus 2t equals 2. So um, we can then say that y is equivalent if we solve for y in terms of 2t or t. We get 2t plus 2. And then if we plug in the value of y and z into the first equation, we can solve for x. And you get that x equals negative 3t. And it tells us that there's an infinite set of points where these three planes meet, where x is negative 3 times the value of t, where t is, we set z equal to something, y is 2t plus 2, and z could be any value t. And you can change this around where this is based on picking a value for z and then calculating y and x, but you can do that in different orders. And again, all I did was I took the value of z, I plugged it in, so y minus 2t equals 2. I solved for y, I added 2t to both sides, 2 plus 2t. And then in this equation, I plugged those values in. So it was x minus 2 plus 2t, two that's the value of y, plus 5 times t, that's the value of z, has to equal negative 2. So x minus 2 minus 2t two plus 5t equals negative 2. We can combine some things here. And we get x plus 3t. We can add our 2 over. Equals 0. So finally, subtract 3t and x equals negative 3t. And that's how that works out. All right, so that's really everything here that we're introducing. And I know that I kind of bounced around with the order that I did it in because I was trying to highlight what you would eventually find. But Gaussian elimination, um, there are some exact orders to it. But right now, we're just at a level where I want you to play with these three moves. And as general guidance, start up here, work your way down, and then go on and over. But you can do it in different orders. As long as your arithmetic is correct, you will get a new system that's consistent with the original and has the same set of solutions. Thanks.